In the opening issue of Das Berlinische Archiv der Zeit und ihres Geschmacks, one of the more long-lived of the many ephemeral journals in the 1790s, Johann Friedrich Reichert pronounced on the state of music in Berlin. His point of comparison this time was Paris, having traveled there in 1792, and in criticizing the lack of discernment among audiences attending the Nationaltheater in Berlin, he turned to Paris's theatrical setup, a large national opera, a national comic opera, an Italian opera, and some 30 smaller venues for pieces of all other kinds. In such a milieu, ooh, I was clicking my own computer and nothing was happening. In such a milieu, the audience learns to distinguish by degrees the genres, gets an idea of the wide range of art. It soon learns to distinguish the researching, inventing, and genuinely composing artist from imitative and composing workers, to distinguish art from artifice, a genuine artwork from a merely pleasing piece of art, and to value each according to its content. Regretting the cohabitation of high and low in the Berlin Nationaltheater, Reichert here celebrated the expansion of the theatrical economy in Paris as a way of teaching the undiscerning audience the hierarchy of musico-theatrical art, and crucially, a hierarchy of art framed in terms of genre. Now, this was not the impression that Parisian critics tended to give of their post-revolutionary theatrical scene. In 1791, what's known as the freedom of the theatres had passed into French law with the bill put together by Le Chapelier. This law removed the monopoly rights to repertoire of the royal theatres and allowed for any citizen to open a theatre as long as she or he informed the municipality. Even at that moment, there was concern that allowing more theatres would result in dissipation and distraction with a resulting moral decadence of the Parisian stage. And there were indeed widespread complaints that the mixed repertoire at the opera was lowering the tone. What did transpire was an unprecedented proliferation of both theatrical enterprises and genres. So here are some examples. Um, now, you can see some of them were very short-lived. You can also see why, given the titles, the Théâtre des sans culottes is obviously very closely associated with a particular group of people that, you know, were less appreciated after the terror. <clears throat> As for genres, <clears throat> well, these were some of my favorites. The sans culottes dramatique is the only one of its genre uh, that I found. Um, the comédie de gros genre is also interesting in the distinction it's trying to make between high and low, but also, I think, taking the mickey out of the comédie de grand genre, so this, uh, uh, this idea of vulgar size rather than actually um, sort of elevation that the term grand has as opposed to gros. Um, then we have a, a lovely example of the simple proliferation of descriptors, a melodrame héroïque en trois actes à grand spectacle, on est de chant, danse, combat, évolution militaire, explosion. And then, actually, this is probably my favorite, we have a comedy ou non en un acte. So it's actually a comedy interspersed with sections of a tragedy, um, you know, and the generic descriptor, descriptor is all about uh, throwing a question about, about the genre. So... <clears throat> the free market that some of the revolutionaries had envisaged, where the good judgment of Le Peuple regulated the theatres through their ticket purchases, did not suit their purposes very long. Sorry, to their ticket purchases did not suit their purposes very long, particularly as this proliferation of theatrical en enterprise tended to be in the direction of popular theatres, considered to be of dubious moral value and often on the boulevard de Temple, yielding the term boulevard theatres. The opera could not withstand the competition and in August 1793 began to receive again on the quiet the subsidy removed a few years earlier. The theatrical infrastructure was also somewhat unstable. In 1795, Paris had as many as 51 theatres, but by the time Napoleon re-regulated the theatres in 1806 and 7, this number was already back down to 18 because they kept going bankrupt. Now, Napoleon's re-regulation is often attributed to his love of order, but there was, of course, much more at stake. In particular, re-establishing the status of the official theatres and the national tradition, and also establishing a pre prestigious platform for imperial communication. 
To this end, the monopoly rights of the Opéra, the Opéra Comique, and the Théâtre Français over their repertoires were reasserted, and together with the Opéra Bouffe, these institutions made up the four Grands Théâtres. To increase the sustainability of the theatres, Napoleon's ministers eventually reduced the total number of theatres to eight, leaving only four boulevard or secondary theatres to reduce competition between these secondary theatres, and they were also limited by genre. So, uh, this is the redistribution of genres between the four remaining boulevard theatres. So, at the Théâtre de Vaudeville, the Théâtre des Variétés, we've got vaudeville, essentially, but short plays and parodies with these popular melodies to which new texts are written. And then at the Gaiety and the Ambigu Comique, you've got pantomime and melodrame with farces. They can also retext uh, pre-existing melodies there. Now, this re-regulation involved a large number of theatres being shut. Uh, the message was very clear. Theatre was under governmental control and, in fact, increased censorship and the national tradition and official culture came first. A concern for theatrical order had been expressed openly by many critics for some time before this re-regulation. Um, just a, a strong example is one reviewer in the Opinion du Parterre who saw the Théâtre de Vaudeville as degenerating by overreaching itself. I like that particular uh, combination there. So the national genre of vaudeville was in danger of becoming, I quote, nothing but a species of drama written in overprecious jargon and dotted with arias of great ostent ostentation or ensemble pieces stolen from the opera comique. So such practices, he went on, were subversive of the old genre that had made the vaudeville theatre prosperous and which should be restored. At the same time, after the re-regulation, these concerns and this anxiety continued. Um, so the playwright and theatre manager Augustin Apte violently attacked the continued mixing of genre at the ambigu and comique the ambigu comique and the gaiety, so the sort of disobedience of Napoleon's re-regulation, um, which, in his opinion, recalled the worst excesses and confusion of the immediate post-revolutionary years. From the revolutionary anarchy was born theatrical anarchy. In these moments of unbridled license, almost all genres were played equally in the same theatre. This confusion of genres, consequence of the chaos that we are coming out of, must it still exist? Should we not maintain a distinct genre in each theatre? Now, this discourse of genre is neither unprecedented nor unfamiliar, uh, whether it was about opera comique in the 18th century or an attack by adherents of French classicism on a romantic mixing of registers, you know, think Victor Hugo. But rather than just filling out this narrative with its particular Napoleonic manifestation, I want to use this moment for two purposes. To show, as my colleagues are as well, the limitations of treating the Napoleonic era as one of top-down cultural policy that was simply passively received, which is a reading of this period that has plagued it and I think perhaps led to its neglect, but also to open up some new possibilities for thinking more broadly about how genre may or may not have structured musical life, and particularly musico-theatrical life in the 19th century. My point of departure is a simple one, and one highlighted recently by Mark Everest in his Jams article on genre and power, that genre continued to be an important category in cultural and musical life in 19th century Paris. Now, this point bears repeating and being brought into dialogue with some of our standard Dalhousian narratives about musical genre in the 19th century. As Emanuele Sinice has pointed out, the German romantic commitment to the transcendence of genre, to the ultimate subjectivity of artistic expression, has cast a long shadow that we have not yet escaped. In one particularly amusing critique, building on David Charlton's work, he suggests that the currency gained by the notion of rescue opera over the course of the 20th century is due in significant part to the need to have a genre for Fidelio to transcend. But if I'm looking to offer a historical corrective to this narrative, it's not merely a French or Parisian alternative to German Romantic culture. French repertoire was exported across Europe, often prompting genre-framed responses such as Reichart's. Equally, similar systems of legislation and monopoly based around genre are found outside of Paris, including increasingly in Berlin as the number of theatres expanded. 
More importantly, the challenges of studying the broad spectrum of music theatre in this period raise questions about how we attend to genre, particularly when our models are drawn from literary theory or its application to instrumental music. Preeminent among these approaches was and remains the work done by Geoffrey Kalberg in the 80s and 90s on Chopin and the rhetoric of genre. Adapting Hans Robert Jauss's integration of genre into the idea of the horizon of expectations, Kalberg conceptualized genre as a contract between composer and audience, a form of communication rather than classification. And both Jauss and Kalberg suggest that genre has an existence as a communal construct that could be generalized from practice and discourse. This idea of the generic contract, however, is a much less revealing model in the context of music theater. As Everest has also remarked, the range and variability of agents and institutional pressures makes the work more unstable, authorship more distributed, media more multiple, and thus the rece reception experience even more varied. And the generic descriptors of works often changed between institutions and in translated versions too, between poster and printed libretto, meaning that the act of communication made with a generic description, descriptor is actually very hard to generalize. Such variation raises a second reflection. How might the idea of genre as a communal construct be enhanced or challenged by the greater attention we now bring to performance? Even if a work did travel with a consistent generic marker, the different stages and troops would bring to it vastly differing performance styles and actors in vastly differing spaces. Thirdly, I think that the familiar, moderately destabled concept of genre as a communal construct has been too often applied without historical or geographical specificity. So that destabilizing process that um, has been going on across the 20th century has itself been somewhat historically insensitive. So generic statements may have had more or less valence in building audiences' horizons of expectations at different points and in different contexts. Generic constructs may have been more or less communal or unified, and invocations of genre may indeed have referred to different concepts of genre. So it is for this reason that I am proposing a historical approach to genre consciousness rather than genre, where genre consciousness is something that creative agents, performers, audiences, etc., experience and display at different points in different ways. And by posing the question this way, my aim is to avoid slipping into any inadvertent reification or heuristic use of genre, sometimes the same thing, by asking constantly what kind of genre consciousness, why genre consciousness at this moment, consciousness of which concept of genre, or indeed whether genre consciousness at all. So to give some examples of how this might open up different possibilities, the period I began by describing, I would argue, offers a distinct manifestation of genre consciousness by virtue of that very compacted expansion and then compression of the official generic landscape. So my first case study is two meta-theatrical scenes performed at the Théâtre de la Gaîté in 1808. The first piece, Martinville's Le Mariage de Mélodrame et de la Gaîté, was performed there in March 1808 and appears to mark the new post-regulation repertoire. The second, Abdes Le Siège de la Gaieté, or Le Passé, Le Présent et Le Futur, was performed for the opening of the new theatre. It's been renovated in November. Both include songs set to existing melodies in the manner of a vaudeville, and they both juxtapose allegorical figures, such as the personification of the Gaieté, the theatre itself, or the personification of melodrame, with stock theatres uh, of the theatre's repertoire, sorry, stock characters of the theatre's repertoire. So in reading them, we might gain some access into the views of their creators on genre and the recent genre legislation. But in addition, these texts were both written with the purpose of portraying the theatrical community to itself, the troupe, the theatrical tradition, and audiences. And they were written by, by authors who had recently written much more conventional pieces for performance at the Gaiety. These pieces are both set on the Boulevard de Temple with the facade of the Théâtre de la Gaiety as the backdrop, and they feature particular actors in their most celebrated roles. They thus might also offer some commentary on what were more broadly considered to be the set of norms in the theatre and the horizon of expectations that it engendered as an institution. 
Le mariage de Maladram presents the assignment of Maladram to the gaiety by the 1807 laws as a pragmatic calculation in the face of necessity on the part of the personification of the theatre, the gaiety. So the scene opens with the gaiety discussing her wedding later that day with typical gaiety personnel such as the Commedia dell'arte figures Cassandre and Colobine. The gaiety has still not decided whom she is to marry, and there is, of course, much comic business. But eventually, three suitors present themselves, a marionette, a childlike vaudeville, and then the macho melodrame, whom she, the gaiety, decides would be the most useful partner. <coughs> Le siège, as you might imagine, has more of an edge, representing the imposition of the genres of melodrame and pantomime on the personnel of the gaiety as a violent threat against the assembled company. At the last minute, the siege is resolved as an enforced treaty by the appearance of the personification of the all-powerful gaiety herself, so she's sort of like a sun rising at the end this time. Um, an unsatisfactory deus ex machina conclusion that may or may not have undermined itself for the audiences in its suddenness. I mean, this is an argument people use about the sudden conclusions to melodrama. So, I mean, that might reinforce the idea of the legislation as an imposition in this reading. Now, I have no evidence either way of that. Uh, that's a close reading. But there is another piece of evidence as to the insorial intentions of Apte in commenting on these regulations. So Le Siege was originally much more explicitly critical of Napoleonic authority. The opening couplet of the manuscript that was submitted to the censors in advance of the performance involved Pierrot asking the rest of the troupe whether they were happy with Arlequin leading their assemblée. Now, that latter term already gives away that this is a reference to the current leadership of France, and that reference would have been reinforced by the frequent portrayals of Napoleon as Harlequin in caricature. And needless to say, this potential parallel and criticism of Napoleon was struck out by the censors. But it does give us some clue as to Apte's stance here. Now, I'm skipping over a lot of details um, within these pieces, but common to both of them is the representation of melodrame as other to the gaiety. In each case, the personification of melodrame appears armoured and masked, accompanied by outlandish and military sounds, so the tam-tam, the clar clarions, trumpets and a cannon, and a huge retinue um, involving soldiers from all over the globe in Le Siege, actually. And from this initial position of opposition, in Le Mariage, the melodrame and the gaiety are made to see their common ground in pantomime and song and laughter. In Le Siege, Melodrame, Pontemime, and the Gaiety Troupe are merely made to see the mutual benefits of combining forces. What is curious, however, is that Melodrame was not a foreign genre to the Théâtre de la Gaiety, according to the calendar of performances that were, were in the process of assembling uh, a project in, in the UK. Um, in the years leading up to the decrees, plays called Melodrame had regularly appeared on the Gaiety stage, including by these two authors, Indeed, the one review I found of Le Mariage begins with precisely this point, claiming that melodrama and the gaiety have long been united. So why then was melodrama, melodrama considered to be an imposition on the theatre by both of these audience, uh, authors? Now, it is hard to interpret these highly intertextual pieces with precision, but my theory is that the style of melodrama, performance and text, represented in these pieces as noisy, militaristic and spectacular, may well have been foreign to the gaiety, and in fact derived from the Port Saint-Martin Théâtre, recently closed by the 1807 decree. The Port Saint-Martin was originally built as a temporary house for the Paris Opera, it had an enormous stage, it wasn't on the Boulevard de Temple, and it was one of the theatres that had previously specialised in particularly spectacular melodramas, often historical or exotic, and it was this repertoire that the gaiety was, would now adopt. This theory finds some support in the text of Le Siège. The personification of the gaiety at the end attempts to persuade and console her troupe that the melodrame that threatens them is not really so bad and that contrary to their objections, it sometimes works well in petites maisons, in small houses. Pursuing this argument in Le Mariage and Le Siège, Apte and Martinville are not only pointing out that genre, genres were imposed on institutions arbitrarily as a means of organising repertoire, but also that generic, label, excuse me, that generic labels were not the most useful way of accounting for sameness and difference in theatrical performances and experiences at that time. 
So differences in performance style, in troupe, in stage machinery, in sound effects, in stage and acoustics formed a more significant part of the audience's horizon of expectations at the Gaiety than did a mere generic label. Thus, the genre consciousness forced on writers and audiences by the 1807 decree is represented as at odds with the level of genre consciousness formed by mere attendance at the theatre. It's both vaguer and more specific than the still emerging definitions of melodrame as a generic descriptor at the time. <clears throat> Now, my second manifestation asks why genre consciousness and returns us to the mobilization of genre by Parisian critics under Napoleon, or indeed Reichert in Berlin in 1795. I mean, I think these are not just anxieties about genre being expressed clearly. Um, to return to Ap Day in 1814 to make the obvious point, the anarchy of the theatres reflected and sustained the continuing lack of separation between popular and elite culture and a continuing social anarchy. So the rhetoric of genre is mobilized not just to categorize subject matter or style or to separate the, separate the manner of representation of noble characters from that of low-born grotesque ones, but it also designates the social class of the repertoire represented by the geographical placing of the theater in which it is performed. Now, if this has been a feature of Parisian genre consciousness among critics for a while, at least since the growth of the fair theatres in the 18th century and the resulting concerns about taste, this anxiety has a new urgency in the wake of the revolution, and it finds a new focus in genres such as melodrama, the most generically mixed boulevard genre, with tragic aspirations and high-born characters. So thus, the same writer in the Opinion du Parterre, who complained about vaudeville overreaching itself, also despaired of melodrama's pretensions to the higher genres. <clears throat> this child of the boulevards, whose destiny would be to return drama to its infancy if it acquired a consistent presence on theatres other than the temporary stages from which it came, this tragedy in bloated prose has for several years made numerous attempts to invade the field of Corneille and Racine, Cunot and Gluck, Gatry and Favard. It is fortunate that the public is stubborn enough to repel these formless productions that degrade the scene and must return to the places in which they were born. Now, clearly that's not happening, and this is why the critic is anxious. Um, but as in Reichert's more positive assessment of Paris' theatre scene, Genre here is used to cordon off what is considered to be entertainment and commercial spoken and music theater, and degraded at that in these terms, from high artworks, and also to cordon off the discerning audiences from the undiscerning. And you know, this is uh, an answer to why genre consciousness on the part of critics at this moment, or on the part of Napoleon's administration. A response to the rising threat of popular consumption in the theatrical sphere and the increasingly mixed audiences, and to the recent threat of popular participation in the political sphere. But it also might prompt reflection on the question of consciousness of what kind of genre, what kind of concept of genre is circulating at this moment. And here my argument intersects with Matthew Galbot's recent recasting of the development of genre categories in the 19th century. So the older functional implications of genre, that is their relationship to performance settings or occasions or to subjects of representation, he says this persisted in the 19th century, contrary to Dahlhaus's narrative, but that they are increasingly accompanied by a meta level of categories lurking behind genre categories, which reflect 19th century attention to, I quote, creative origin, whether personal or national or social demographic. Origin, he argues, becomes the highest regulating category in artistic production and could, by transcending many genres, become a basis of criticism and meaning in music. And he isolates art, folk and popular as primary categories at this meta level. Indeed, that the distinction between these meta levels of cultural production was not sufficiently distinct was the motivation for the Parisian critics' generic consciousness and intervention in this period, anxious to perverse preserve the status of elite art, or art in his three categories, and to increase the generic and by extension social hierarchical consciousness of audiences. What I'm arguing, ultimately, is both that we need to pay more and less attention to genre. This is not just because I think our ubiquitous heuristic use of the term has settled at an ahistorical level, 
allowing the phenomenon of genre transgression, for example, to be assumed to be automatically generational of meaning. And this is something that's used quite a lot in opera scholarship. You know, the, 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 the turn from speech to song, for example, is a genre transgression. To put this another way, I don't want genre consciousness merely to function as a corrective, although I think doubting or perhaps questioning to what extent genre had any bearing on one's horizons of expectations is valuable. But I also think we can think about this more positively. It's that exploring the relationship between legislative, institutional and discursive forms of genre consciousness and those likely or displayed or performed by audiences and performers brings us closer to how attention might typically have been directed to processes of meaning-making in the theatre, often despite, sometimes in contradiction to, genre. And it's lastly, I think this is valuable because probing types and causes of genre consciousness also brings us closer to understanding relations between human agents and their aesthetic experiences, objects and ideas. Thank you.